I'm excited that our talk here in San Francisco is uh, Mitch Altman. <laughs> Yay! Who uh, is good for a San Francisco talk because he embodies so many of those classic San Francisco ideals of exploring and experimenting and being creative and figuring out how to live a life true to your ideals. Um, so, founder of Noise Bridge, our local co founder of Noise Bridge, our local epic hacker space, and CEO of Cornfield Electronics with all these cool toys that people here can play with after. Um, take it away. Cool. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And hey to everyone who is uh, watching remotely. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to the slides now. Um, so this is my contact info. Please feel free to contact me anytime for any reason. I'm totally happy to help uh, any way I can, always. So um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of stuff that is totally my opinion, obviously. Even if it sounds like I'm saying it emphatically, it's still obviously just my opinion. And I don't expect everyone here to agree with everything I say. But um, you know, we, 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 we can learn from the experience of others, for sure. But uh, in order to live a life that each of us, in order to live a life that you feel is totally awesome, you got to do things in your own way. And, um, and that's often not what. Uh, conventional wisdom tells us is the thing to do. Um, so, yeah, so it's just my opinions. Um, and my talk today is about doing things together, and it's really about community and the need for community. We can do so much on our own. We've got big brains, we've we got these big brains. They're sometimes problematic, but they're cool. Uh, we can do a lot on our own, but when we put our big brains together, we create something way bigger way bigger than the sum of our parts. And that's why we have you know, like companies and things. Uh, that's one of the good things about companies. Um, there's a lot of things we can't do on our own, though. Um, like, here's uh, some high school kids that I met in China uh, who were invited there. They knew nothing about uh, all this physics, but each person knew some things, and they had some mentors there. And collectively, knowing starting from nothing, they made an, uh, um, an atomic force microscope out of Legos. And um, there's other things we can't do on our own as well, like um, having a pillow fight of thousands of people in San Francisco, which happens every year. Um, lots of fun things we do much more cool when we're together. Um, but we're not all that good at doing things together in our modern world. Um, it's kind of hard, and that's because most of us weren't fortunate enough to be raised in a loving community where we got all of our needs or most of our needs met, where we grew up always knowing that it's OK to be our own unique weird selves. Most of us didn't have that. But we need community. Back at the beginning of our species, um, we evolved coming together in community. That's because we didn't have huge muscles and big strength and scary roars. Um, we had big brains. And we put our big brains together and we support ourselves in community. And um, even though, and back then we needed to do that in order to survive in an often hostile environment. Need. We feel, even though now we don't need that just to survive, we do need that to feel part of something bigger than ourselves, to feel worthwhile, to have thriving in our lives. We need to feel we're part of something bigger than ourselves. We need that. And yet in our modern world, there's so precious little of it. So we try looking for it where we can. We try getting it from our families of origin. That works for some people. That didn't work so well for me. Um, but if it worked for you, that's fantastic. That's a great resource. 
Um, for many people, they can find it from their places of worship. It also doesn't work for me or many people I know. We try to create our own, perhaps, but you know, finding community is, is difficult. Schools at their best can give us some community, but quite often the schools are more like that. Um, and then we try to find it at work. Uh, Google, I hope, is better than this. I don't know what you feel like personally, but um, we try to find it at work, and we can get some there. But uh, we try to get it from TV. That's one of my favorite things to hate. Um, here's a whole bunch of people alone watching something seemingly together. Um, and uh, <laughs> the people on TV seem to be friends, but they don't even know these people exist. Therefore, they can't care about it. And friends care about each other. This is not community. And the internet. We try to get it on the internet, but the internet usually looks like this. <laughs> we need it. We need community, but we don't really have it. Uh, I don't know about you, but like as a geek, when I was a little kid, it was dangerous to be a geek. And I was beaten up and bullied all the time as a geeky kid. And um, every day at school, I was beaten up. Uh, I did not have community. I was terrified of humans, because humans meant people who were going to beat me up, often while the gym teacher watched. I don't know what it takes to be a gym teacher, but uh, uh, so my parents were no help. They were just totally depressed, too. Uh, so my life was total hell as a kid. And when I got home, I escaped into the magical world of television, or I tried to anyways. Of course, these things never work. But um, as long as the TV show was on, I could seemingly forget about my horrible, ex depressed existence, um, which made me more uh, depressed because I would compare myself to the kids on TV who were beautiful, had loving parents, understanding friends, and problems that always resolved by the end of 30-minute show. Comparing myself to that was horribly depressing. I wasn't doing anything useful. I wasn't going out and doing things. I wasn't learning how to deal with other kids. I was eating junk food like the uh, commercials were telling me to do and showing me to do. And I wanted all these toys that I couldn't get. And I became more of a target because I was fat and uh, totally un, you know, unable to deal with humans. And um, more of a target at school, only to try to escape more into TV when I got home. And that is addiction. It was the first addiction of mine. I became really good at addiction. Uh, that's another story, though. Um, but I did eventually quit television um, in 1980. And um, I started doing all these things, uh, more of all these things that I had already been doing, like doing these geeky things, which were really, really cool. And I could make all these things and make things happen. And I could, uh, uh, I got really good at it. <laughs> I got really good at it, enough so that later in life, um, I could become a consultant and help small companies with their electronic problems, usually with little boards with microcontrollers. And I did a whole bunch of different things. Um, and through the years, um, I eventually learned to live a life that was appropriate for me. And I was making enough money doing consulting for small companies, um, doing lots of interesting things. And I'll come back to that later, because it's relevant to what I'm uh, going to talk about with community and hacker spaces. Um, so the thing is, we do need to feel community. We need to feel part of something bigger than ourselves. And because of that, we don't, and since we don't have it, we can be manipulated by this need. And in our modern world, there are all sorts of ways that we're manipulated. In uh, grade school, and unfortunately for adults sometimes as well, um, people band together in bullies. They're afraid of the bullies. Everyone's terrified of being singled out by the bullies. You don't want to be like that, that little kid over there who's being beaten up. So quite often, we join in with the bullies. It's not fun, but people have to laugh at it anyways. I don't know what football's all about. Like It's totally like whatever. But people seem to go into that, and then they start screaming the same thing at the same time. They seem to know it. They, when to do that, I, I'll never understand that. If that works for you, great. But people are, seem to be manipulated with that sometimes, too. And imagine you know, you're in a big square where someone's a really good speaker, and everyone is thrusting out little red books in Tiananmen Square way back in the day. That must have been really high. 
course, the end result wasn't so good. It didn't end too well. This also didn't end too well, but it must have been super high to have a million people in Nuremberg thrusting out your arms this way. Again, people being manipulated by our need for community. Um, wars are also this. Many people, after going into a war, have said it's the best time of their life, not because they love killing people necessarily, but because they were emotionally engaged and supporting each other for the first time in their life. But for this end, we can do something better than all of these. I've been going to hacker conferences to, since 2006 and giving talks small and big and uh, workshops small and big, and they are way more positive. We can come together with our need for being part of something bigger in something that is inspiring, something that helps people grow and learn and do all sorts of cool things. That one was in Brazil. This is me teaching 50 people how to solder at a co uh, hacker conference in Germany. It's at the end of December every year, and uh, that's coming up this time, the 35th one. They've been doing this a while. They're really good at it. It's, it's amazing. So anyways, it's really cool. And all I'm doing is teaching them how to solder. Big deal. They're just melting a little bit of metal, and they can make a blinky light. But look, they're happy. <laughs> all you have to do is. Bring people together with something they feel is enjoyable, and people have an enjoyable time. Hackerspaces are the everyday, every night version of this in your own local area. And there are thousands of them in the world, and they do that really well. So hackerspaces, what are they? Well, they're way cooler than any internet meme you can think of. They're physical places where people come together in supportive community, everyone's encouraged to explore and do what they find meaningful in doing. That's it. It doesn't matter what those activities are. It's places where people do this, and it's super enjoyable. It's really about the community. Whatever the activities are, is my uh, opinion, is really just the excuse for people to come together, because we need that. And when people are coming together in a hacker space, they probably are going to come up with all sorts of cool tools to do the things that they want to try doing. And um, there are a lot of cool tools, but it's not about the tools. Again, it's about the community. Get that? Community. OK, so, um, but hackerspaces do come up with lots of amazing tools, all sorts of amazing things. And people usually think if they hear hackerspace, makerspace, whatever, they think of tech. And there's plenty of tech to go around, lots of amazingly cool stuff. And these are just some of the things that I make to teach people electronics and, and soldering. Excuse me. And, uh, but there's much more than that. There's so many activities, and depends on the uh, people who start and run a hackerspace, what kind of activities go on, which means what kind of tools there are. And so there can be fabrication tools for building amazing things with laser cutters and 3D printers and uh, wood and metal and plastic. There can be uh, all sorts of things for art and craft, like this, or music, um, food. Food hacking is amazing. Uh, biology and science and math and whatever people want to do. But again, it's about community. And here again, some happy people who I'm teaching to solder. They're happy. And it's for people of all ages, old and young. And it doesn't matter if people ever do what I'm teaching them or anyone else is teaching them. Just the act of coming together inspires people. And if they make something and it does something they think is cool, it gives people a sense of accomplishment. It gives people a sense of confidence that they bring forward for the rest of their lives. And who knows what people do with that in their lives once they have that. And um, yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's actually magic. So I do want to mention that I'm calling these things hackerspaces, but people can also call them makerspaces, fab labs, or whatever. There are all these different names. It doesn't matter which name you use, as long as they're places where people are supported by their community to explore and do what they think is really cool. I like the word hackerspace because it's not about making a thing. Making a thing is great, but it's much more than making a thing. It's about coming together and supporting each other and doing it because it's wonderful. I like the word hackerspace. Again, it's the original word, so that's the one I'm using. And since I'm using hackerspace, it involves the word hacking. Again, there's many definitions for this. The word hacking 
was used by the mainstream media to talk about people breaking into computers and stealing stuff. That is not what we do at hackerspaces. If anyone does that at any hackerspace uh, and they get caught, they get booted. So um, it's not really helping people to come together. So hacking, in my way of looking at it, is a really seeing the world as full of resources. Our world is full of resources. There's all sorts of things. There's things we can buy. There's things that other people have thrown away. There's all sorts of things we can use, and we can use them for any purpose we want. It doesn't have to be for the purpose that it was intended for by the people or the companies that created it. We can use all of this for our projects to improve them. We can see what works, what doesn't work, and then we can learn from that and share that with other people. And that is what hacking is all about. And that's the definition that was created in MIT at the Model Railroad Club in 1953 before people really even heard of computers. So it's not about computers. It's a way of looking at things and being, a way of being. And we do all of this because it's incredibly enjoyable. And if you're a geek like me, we have to do this. So it really is a way of living. And that's another reason why I like the word hacker space rather than just maker space. Um, you don't have to be an entrepreneur if you're a hacker. Um, but if you're going to be a good entrepreneur, you do have to be a good hacker. You must. You must go out and see things and what works and do things your own way and be supported and share. This is what makes a good entrepreneur. And I'm going to mention something about entrepreneurship because that's part of hackerspaces. Not all of it, but part of it. Uh, and you've probably noticed that in our world that there are a lot of startups now. We are in San Francisco where there are a lot of startups. And unfortunately, almost all of them are stupid. <laughs> I'll talk more about that later, too. So I am against stupid startups. I want people to do something meaningful and worthwhile and put that into the world. So anyways, what can be hacked? It's not just tech. Of course, there's tech and electronics involved. But there's art and craft and music and science and yourself. We need to hack ourselves if we're going to improve and live our lives. We need to hack our communities to continually grow, see what works, what doesn't, and make our communities better. We hack the planet because the planet needs improvement as well. Everything can be improved. Everything can and should be hacked. Everything, including education. And this is one of the reasons why hackerspaces are getting so much uh, uh, attention in the last many years and why they've grown so much is because they're fantastic learning environments. Education doesn't have to look like this. Education is not taking tests. Taking tests is about evaluation of learning, supposedly. But now school is only about the tests, the thing you're supposed to be having only for evaluation. People are being trained for taking the test. That's like Volkswagen changing the test for getting a good grade on their EPA. It doesn't work. All it does is make people into good test takers if they're good at it. So is this education? Yes. Is it good education? No. <laughs> Can we do better? Absolutely. If people are motivated to learn, then people learn. Learning is fun. We're doing this our whole lives. If we go to a place like a hackerspace where people are being encouraged to explore and do things that are meaningful, that are fun and enjoyable, then we find projects that are cool. And when we find a project we, we think is cool, we want to learn as much as we can. We're motivated to learn as much as we can to make our projects awesome. That's project-based, hands-on, play-based learning. And this is why, actually, schools are starting to put uh, hackerspaces as part of their curriculum. And schools and education can look like this. And in fact, they are now more and more. Education is about learning a lifetime of learning. Because we don't stop learning once we get out of school. If we stop learning once we get out of school, we just are waiting to die. And there's nothing wrong with waiting to die, but life can be way cooler than that. So it can be very fulfilling. And maybe some of you have noticed that we live in a society with capitalism. Uh, and with capitalism, we have the absurd situation where you have to have numbers on a screen or fists full of dollars in order to have food and shelter. That's kind of bizarre, but it's true. 
This is the way our planet is right now. So in order to get this money, what do you do? Well, most people get a job. And to have a job, you go to work. Some of you may have found a better place than this, like I said. But a lot of us on our planet, according to the internet where all truth lay, 80% of Americans don't like their work. And a good percentage of those hate their work. But I love my job. I turn TVs off for a living. I created this device called TV Be Gone, which is a keychain that turns televisions off in public places. <laughs> and for the last 14 years, I and 12 friends have made a living on this. Um, and uh, I want to talk about a bit about entrepreneurship, because this is another reason why hackerspaces have been focused upon a lot uh, in the last few years. Entrepreneurship is not this. It's not, if you're going to be a good entrepreneur anyways, it's not about making money. Most entrepreneurs, most people that call themselves an entrepreneur, the first thing they think about is, I'm going to make money. How am I going to make money? I'll start a startup. Yeah. What should the startup be? I don't know. A lot of people making apps. Maybe I'll make an app. Mine will be orange. Whatever. That's stupid. Don't do that can do it if you want to. But it's stupid. You don't want to be stupid. Do something cool. Entrepreneurship can be and should be, in my view, creating meaning. If you make time to explore and do something you think is cool, and you find something cool and it's meaningful to you, and you think other people might like it, and they think it's meaningful, those are the kind of things in capitalism that people will pay you to do. And now you have a startup worth starting. So. Back to my personal stuff here, because it's relevant. Again, you know, I was, grew up depressed. I escaped into television. I learned to be geeky. I became a consultant. I could make enough money in three months to live the rest of the year without working. And I could do all these other things that I loved. Um, and it's all for me about doing things I love. But I wasn't finding things I loved at work. It were things that were cool. Like I was one of the people who created virtual reality. I worked on voice recognition, a lot of um, uh, uh, graphic stuff back when that was there were no graphics cards. Uh, lots and lots of interesting things. But none of them made me jump out of bed in the morning, excited to face the day and solve the problems that needed to be solved. And it was just an OK way to make money. Um, so I actually quit doing that in 2003 so that I could run an experiment on myself. I saved up enough money. I was lucky enough to do that to live a year without working for money. And I would only do what I loved in that year. What would life be like if the only thing you did for that whole year was what you loved? Of course, I still had to do laundry for, but the most part, I was just going to do what I loved. And if work came along that I loved, I would take it. But it was kind of scary because I didn't know if I would get any more work if I kept telling people no because I didn't love what they were offering me. But I did it anyways. And I started working on all the, I did volunteer work and all these things I loved, but I started working on projects that I had been thinking about but didn't have time to work on because I'd only been doing work, uh, electronic work on all these things for other people. And I ran out of electronics kind of energy. But uh, this one project that uh, I worked on that really got on a roll was a result of TVs popping up everywhere in public places. Uh, I quit TV in 1980. My life suddenly had tons of time to start facing the issues in my life to start doing things I thought were worthwhile, to learn how to handle dealing with the weird, bizarre social dynamics of human beings. And, um, and it turns out I actually like humans. They're my favorite species now. But um, uh, yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, I had all this stuff going on in my life. And suddenly, in 1993, TV started popping up everywhere in public places. Some of you may not be old enough to remember that there was a time that TVs did not exist in public places. They were only in living rooms, and they were expensive things. And people saw a TV in a restaurant. They thought that was an indication of it being a divey, horrible place. But it started happening. And uh, it took me 10 years to get a place in my life where I could start actually working on this project. So this was in 2003. I was like, now I have the time. I'm going to work on this project. And I did. And I did it 
because I totally loved this project. It was meaningful for me because this force that uh, was totally uh, taken over my life when I was a kid was starting to come back. And I wanted to get rid of it. And so as a geek, I knew I could. It's just a remote control with a bunch of off codes, all of them I could get. And it just plays one after the other after the other. And if you press the button and make that happen, eventually the TV in front of you turns off. Totally simple. I figured it would take about three weeks. It took me a year and a half. Projects always take longer than you think they should. Uh, but I was obsessed with this project, and I got all the off codes. I made them open source, so no one ever has to do that ever again. They're all online for free. Grab them, turn TVs off. But I made TV Be Gone, and um, it was a work of love. A bunch of friends uh, helped me, um, and uh, I made one for all my friends. And we all went all over San Francisco turning TVs off in public places, and it was really, really fun. And of course, they told their friends, and many of their friends wanted it. And it turned out many of the friends of the friends wanted them. And that's when I thought, gee, this thing that I just made one for me and friends since they wanted them. Other people want them. Maybe, maybe I could make a bunch. Because one of the things I did as a consultant for small electronic companies was manufacture things for them. So I learned how to do that. Maybe I could make some of these. So I made as many as I could afford, which was 20,000 kind of a gamble. But I did some math. I figured if I did that, then I could break even if I sold 5,000 of those 20,000. And if I sold any more of those, that would supplement my income. It might take five or 10 years, but whatever. That would be cool. There'd be five or 10,000 people going all over the world turning TVs off. That'd be pretty cool. So um, I did that. And then it turned out that I was absolutely, totally wrong. I sold all 20,000 in three weeks. Yeah, I was on National Public Radio, New York Times, uh, on People Magazine, and uh, you know Fox News. I went. Uh, I was brought in a limo from my apartment in San Francisco to the Fox News um, um, uh, studios in Oakland, and they said, "Well, will your thing work on live? 14 million people watching." And the person asked me, "Will it turn off these monitors here in our studio?" And I'm like. I don't know, let's see. And I do it, and I push the button, and all of them turn off. <laughs> and the, the whole place like gasps, and then they start laughing. And um, yeah, and then afterwards, one of the people at uh, Fox he, was kind of like looking around, and kind of like, like uh, I agree with you. <laughs> and the odd thing is, 10 minutes later, another person that didn't know that other one did the same thing. So how many people at Fox are actually, uh, yeah, if only. <laughs> so anyways, that was 2004 when I put that out. And um, here I am 14 years later. And um, that's the only way I've made money in the last 14 years. Me and 12 friends for 14 years have made a living on this project we think is really cool, really awesome, a project we love. And that brings me to my definition of success. Is that success? No! <laughs> it's a pile of money. <laughs> pile of money is not success. A pile of money is just a pile of money. My definition of success is this. If you explore and do what you love and you find something you love and it's meaningful and you put it out there in whatever way and other people think it's meaningful and they're paying you to do it, you get enough of whatever you need, including money, to keep doing what you love, what more do you need? What more do you need? If you spend even two seconds more making money beyond that, you are wasting your time. Why are you doing that? <laughs> so. Community is what makes all of this re really possible. I wouldn't have been able to do TV Be Gone just on my own. Um, maybe it would have taken way, way, way longer, but I did it way, way, way better because I had a community of friends. With hackerspaces now, we don't have to be lucky enough to have the friends with all these different skills. People with those skills are in our community at our hackerspaces. We can do lots together, and we need to have people together. We can do it so much better together, but often we need it. You know, like Linux wouldn't have happened uh, no matter how brilliant Linus was, is. Um, and 3D printers was an international project, and all these things. We do so much better when we put people together and inspire each other.
And this is what maker fairs were about in the first one in 2006. People who found community with the projects they do and showing them off. But this is what's been going on with hacker conferences for decades now. And my first hacker conference I was invited to because uh, of TV Be Gone, and it was amazing. Thousands of people, almost all of whom do what they love, which makes it super high. Way, unfortunately, different than society at large. And I love that. And when the conference was over, I wanted more. Um, but I had to wait till my next conference. And it was high again. And that was the one in Germany. And, um, and I've been going to these. And I've been helping organize this one ever since. Hope, Hackers on Planet Earth. Um, and um, uh, by my third one, it was just the coolest thing. I mean, they had a, they had a spaceship. <laughs> And I taught people to solder, and they, of course, had lasers and hundreds of talks, one of which was how to start your own hackerspace. And that inspired me and several of my friends from various parts of the US to start hackerspaces. And we all helped each other, and we got help from the Germans who had been looking around and seeing what works and what doesn't work at hackerspaces there for the last many years. And we started the early hackerspaces, some of the early hackerspaces in the US. Uh, Noisebridge in San Francisco, this was in 2007. Hack DC in Washington, DC, and NYC Resistor in New York City. Um, and when we did that in 2007, there were about 40 hackerspaces. And now there's thousands. And this is actually an old picture. China is now just as obliterated with pins for hackerspaces as the rest of the world. And this is from hackerspaces.org, an organizing website that we created to help people start hackerspaces. And the thing is, hackerspaces still all help each other if anyone wants to start one, there's always people to help. And we all help each other. Each one's unique, though. There's no central church of hackerspaces. Each one can organize themselves any way they want and help each other. And there's lots of them all over the world. There's Noisebridge, there's Tokyo. Here's a few in Belgium. These are all ones where I've been in the last year, um, just random ones. I've been to hundreds and hundreds. There's more in Belgium, um, more in Belgium that's in Brazil. Sao Paulo uh, in London, uh, Zagreb, Croatia, where I was a hacker in residence uh, this year. Tommy, one in Tel Aviv, where I was a hacker in residence. These are all me giving workshops soldering. But of course, things go on besides just soldering. That's just pictures I've got. Uh, Urbana, Illinois, where I was a hacker in residence. Uh, Xinjiang, a hacker space, the coolest one in China. The first one in China, too, in Shanghai. But there's lots of cool places in, in China. One's for just little kids. This is the university, Tsinghua University. Uh, Shenzhen do DIY. They have things for little kids and all people of all ages. Uh, Chai Hua uh, is a way cool place in Shenzhen as well. And um, the head of state of China visited them in 2015, while all of Chinese media, with hundreds of millions of people watching, visited this space and said that this hackerspaces are the future of China for education, for economic development, and personal growth. And um, not to be outdone, uh, our president at the time did that too, um, although not hundreds of millions of people watching. Um, but after this, all bureaucrats all over the world knew that they must start hackerspaces. Unfortunately, they don't know what they are, and they make places that look like this which is kind of a waste. But those could get filled up with people doing cool things um, if there's a community that can make that happen. I do want to say that community is hard work. We're not good at this stuff. But we've got to get better at it uh, if we want to have communities that are worth having. And um, yeah, um, I'm actually uh, no longer part of Noisebridge because of some of the serious uh, problems there. Um, and I thought I could have, uh, you know, use my energies for something more positive for me. Um, yeah, and that saddens me. But um, I do wish everyone there the best. Um, but community is very rewarding. It's very rewarding. And uh, it's what's been driving me is helping communities around the world. And that's what I do. One of the things I do is I travel all over the planet. And uh, I want to hammer this in for anyone watching. So let me do this. You out there, listen to this. OK, great. OK, so entrepreneurship doesn't have to be about just making money. 
You need to make enough money to make it all work. Of course, we have a capitalist society, but ha entrepreneurship for it to work has to happen this way in this order. First, you make time, and then you explore, and you find things that you think are cool. You keep trying things. You try it out. Some things work, some things don't. You keep learning from successes, from failures. You learn way more from failures because we fail a lot more than we succeed. But we learn from all of this. And you keep trying again and again. It's a roller coaster. There's ups, there's downs. It's OK. You keep going. You're driven by it because it's awesome. It's cool. And eventually, you find something you love that's meaningful for you. It's meaningful for others. Now you have something that's worth starting because people will pay you for something they find meaningful. And now you have a startup that has some possibility for success. Unfortunately, on our planet right now and here in Ground Zero San Francisco, it's mostly driven by investors who don't care about anything except making money for themselves. No matter what they say, and they believe the lies as they say them, so if you have a VC, a vulture capitalist, sorry, venture capitalist, um, don't believe their shit. <laughs> they believe it, but you don't have to. They want you to have an exit strategy before you even start, and they want you to become the next Apple and the next Google. There already is an Apple and a Google. I don't think the world needs another one. Some people might argue that we already have one too many of each. I'm not saying where I stand there, but um, uh, I'm very happy to be here at one of these corporations uh, who is doing at least some good things in the world. We also don't need to grow. Growing is not always good. We don't have to grow. We just have to have a sustainable business so that the people who are in it find what they do meaningful, and by doing what they find meaningful, get enough of what they need to keep doing it. What would your life be like if you were doing that? Maybe you are doing that here. What would the world be like if there were hundreds of millions of these kind of small, sustainable businesses, most of which don't grow, some of which become popular and they, need to, they want to make whatever they have available to more and more people, and so they can grow, and some investors might even make money from it. Fine. But what would the world be like if there were hundreds of millions of these? And it wasn't 80% of people who didn't like their jobs, but 80% of people who did. And what if a huge percentage of those loved what they were doing in the world with a third of their life going to work? I think the world would be a way more amazing place than it is now. Hackerspaces are one way to do this, because they're places where people come together and are supported by their community to explore and do these kind of amazing things. We need these. Not just hackerspaces, but community in all sorts of ways. And I encourage you all to do that, because if we wait for our governments to do that, we are all going to be dead. But while we're alive, we have the opportunity to do cool things for ourselves and the people around us. So I encourage you all to do that. And if I can help in any way, let me know. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, we have one question. I'm Dory from New York, from Leo. Hi, Mitch. I remember Hi. reading about your brain machine device back in Make Magazine at least 10 years ago. Now that some time has passed, what updates would you make for 2018 and beyond? If any. Well, a lot of things. I've been playing with uh, brainwaves um, stuff all my life. As uh, an undergrad, I, I was a guinea pig for uh, psych experiments, uh, physiological psych experiments. Uh, back then, you had to have things glued to your skull. and uh, uh, But it was cool. You could read your brainwaves. Um, and people have been recording brainwaves since 1928. Uh, and uh, the brain machine came just as sort of this flash of inspiration when I was um, meditating once. And I thought, what would happen if you played brainwaves back? And it turns out when I started researching that, that people have been playing them back ever since they started recording them in 1928. Um, so I made brain machine as a, a 
a simple thing to encourage people to try to make something if they've never made anything before. And it was super popular. Uh, what made it super popular is that it blinks lights, um, the way it works, it blinks lights and makes sound at a sequence of meditation brainwave sequence, uh, frequencies. And if it works for you, your brain just sort of syncs up to it and you follow along and then you meditate. Um, but what makes it super popular is that your brain doesn't know what to do with uh, the blinky light information that feels, fills your whole field of vision. Um, and so since it doesn't understand what to do, it makes stuff up. That's what our brains do when it, something doesn't make sense, which explains a lot of our politics. Um, but uh, what you make up when you're doing the brain machine is uh, you draw from your uh, imagination and your experience and you see beautiful wild colors and patterns. And it turns out a lot of people actually like hallucinating. So uh, it's been a popular project for a long time. And I'm not the only one who makes things like this. I just made one that was really cheap and easy uh, to make. So um, what I've been wanting to do and have been playing with is having input as well as uh, output. So if you have EEG, that's the way to measure brain waves. Uh, there's cheap ones now. There's open source ones. Uh, a friend of mine's working on one called Brain Duino. Works on an Arduino. Um, it's two hundred fifty dollars, and it works great. So if I have that, then it can be reading my brain waves as uh, the blinking lights and the sound are trying to get me to the state that I want. It can be seeing if it's working, and it can alter it, and then get me to where I want to be rather quickly. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I've been working on. And then there's this other thing here. Um, I had a Kickstarter for this a long time ago. And it's, it's kind of weird, but it's like a brain machine, but it, it's way nicer sound and uh, more gentle. You don't hallucinate, but it, it has a 20-minute sequence to bring you to the point of falling asleep to help people sleep. So uh, yeah, I put a lot of time and energy into that. Um, the Kickstarter was successful, but since then, marketing this has just been really difficult. So this hasn't really gone too many places. But I'd love to add um, uh, EEG to that and play around with that. So. Hi there. My, OK, good. Hey. Um, question for you about maker spaces and other communities like that. Um, can you comment a little bit about best practices to make them work? Um, I noticed you highlighted Noisebridge where there were some difficulties, but what, what, are, what do successful makerspaces do to make the community grow and thrive? Uh, that's a big question, um, and it's unique to each space, but there's a few things that are um, probably common for all the ones that are working. Uh, of course, you need to have a business model uh, so that you get more uh, resources in than you use. Uh, and that definitely includes money on our planet. But there are a lot of hacker spaces that are, uh, there were more in the past, but that are squats and they need very, very little money. But you need uh, a bunch of, um, uh, you need a space, otherwise it's not a hacker space. Um, and um, yeah, so there has to be some kind of model for bringing more resources in than you spend. You also have to have a way to organize yourselves so that uh, everyone who's part of the organization feels like this is a great way to organize ourselves, a way of having decision making that everyone involved feels heard and um, feels valuable. You have to have ways of having conflict resolution, because when you have more one or more humans in a room, there will be strife. Um, and uh, we need to have ways that are worthwhile to resolve the conflicts. When people have conflict, and it's always going to happen, uh, if you resolve them, that brings people closer. If people don't, there's like, ah, oh, it's just a little thing. I'm going to ignore it. Then it builds up, and people have resentments. We've all had this with boyfriends, girlfriends, or whatever. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it builds, and resentments build. We have to have ways to encourage people to bring things up while they're little. That's not easy. We're all trained, especially uh, in our modern America, to not say things we know people don't want to hear. But it's super important. We need to learn to do these things. Uh, otherwise, people just end up drifting away rather than staying in a place that is challenging. Um, also, this is a hard part. It's not the fun part of having any community. You need to kick out people who aren't working. You give them plenty of chances. You, know, you don't want to just go, oh. You crossed the unwritten law. Now you're out of it. Sorry. 
Um, you give people a chance to change their behaviors and do it in a way that people feel good. You've got to um, do it in a way that's, uh, in Noisebridge, we have only one rule, uh, and that's be excellent to each other. Um, yeah, if someone's not being excellent, it's not OK to be mean to them. That's not excellent. So if someone's uh, not doing things in a way that fit in with the community, give them plenty of chances. And learn from them as well, because that can be pointing out something that's not working well in your community. But be really nice to them and polite, assertive, of course, um, and resolve the issues. Again, that's a broad generalization, but and it's not easy. It's easy to say. It's super difficult. That's one of the most difficult parts of being in any community or any relationship. But it's way worthwhile. So um, yeah, those are some of the things. You have to have activities that people in the community want to do. And you have to encourage people. Everyone has to encourage each other to uh, put a little bit more past their comfort zone into activities so that people have an exciting environment to come in. The ideal of the hackerspace is a place where people can just pop in any time and something cool will be happening. And then more and more people come, and more, which makes more and more cool people come. And more people are doing more cool things, which make more people come because there's cool things happening, et cetera. So that was all kind of vague, I know. But if you have any specifics, I can address those. <laughs> Um, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how we can improve diversity in our hackerspaces. Uh, they do tend to be very white, and uh, a lot of white privileged people are the people who are participating in them. Not 100%, but uh, you know, I'm interested to, you know, how can we change that, and how can we make it more, you know, diverse from uh, neurodiverse, race, gender, thought, religion, politics, whatever. Yeah. Um, not all hackerspaces feel that's super important. Uh, I do. Um, and at Noisebridge, at the very beginning, we wanted it to be as, uh, you know, ideally to reflect the demographics of San Francisco. Uh, that hasn't happened. People who are white and uh, middle or upper class certainly have more um, opportunities and advantages and privileges than other people. So um, people in that class have more time and also have um, the ability to take time for doing something like this. Um, but given that um, myself included in that class um, have this opportunity and the added privilege, we can share that with others and encourage others to join us. So at the beginning of Noisebridge, um, it was um, probably about 40% female and 60% male and, and a handful of other genders. And, um, we wanted to encourage people to uh, join us. In order to ensure that there was more gender balance, we started doing things from the beginning, getting the tools together so that there were like traditional, whatever to call it, things that are roles for females, like sewing and craft. Um, and what we found is really quickly, uh, since sewing stuff's over here and soldering's over here, electronics, and there's other things and fabrication all around, it's just one big open space, everyone just starts intermixing. And there's no s solid separation anyways between electronics and art, and electronics and sewing, or um, sewing and fabrication of other things. So, uh, And there's certainly no wall that prevents uh, someone of one gender going here or another gender going there. And there's nothing about a human brain, regardless of gender, that says uh, whether you can or cannot hold a soldering iron or can or cannot push fabric through a sewing machine. Um, so doing these things that have been traditionally for one gender and making sure that they're there, especially for the genders that you uh, would normally be underrepresented, uh, has been a really good way at hackerspaces around the world to get more diversity in a positive way. And not just saying having a quota, because <laughs> that doesn't seem to work. Um, and uh, at um, Artisan's Asylum in Boston, there was a woman who was super great at uh, welding. And she started a class that was really popular for a while, maybe it still is, uh, called Welding for Girls. 
And uh, that was a way to get a whole bunch of women in who might not have come otherwise. Uh, San Francisco is a pretty diverse set of different peoples. Uh, Noisebridge is in the mission, which is, uh, was until recently mostly Hispanic, and yet there aren't many Hispanic people at Noisebridge. And we've been rather unsuccessful at getting uh, Hispanic people in, which um, is unfortunate. There's been a number, but um, you know, because we want it to be welcoming for everybody. So, but we keep trying, you know, we have the broader uh, problem of our uh, planet the way it is and the way it has been for thousands of years. So we're not going to solve all the problems right away with just one organization, but we can try things, see what works and what doesn't, share it with others, learn from others of what works and doesn't work from them, and keep trying to make it better. And as long as we keep doing that, it does get better. Yeah. I think we're out of time, but if you have more time or have decided to quit your job and <laughs> do what you love all day, um, well, last night we just decided to have this uh, ad hoc pop-up kind of hackerspace setting, and we have lock picking sets to play with, oh, and we cool. have Mitch's kits to play with, and we have our San Francisco makerspace represented to play with. So. Uh, stay and play, and we can have a little San Francisco community. And is it okay if I take a picture of the audience? Anyone care? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>